Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. I hope you're doing well today. Um, today, we're going to be talking about SOC 2 as part of our continuing web series hosted by ISHU IT. Uh, SOC 2 is becoming one of the fastest growing compliance standards adopted by service providers to highlight their commitment to security, privacy, and data management. Um, today, we're going to have Aditya and Bremel lead you through the scope and the nuances of a SOC 2 attestation. Um, but before I do that, I want to introduce the speakers a little bit. Aditya, the Chief Cybersecurity Officer here at ISHA IT, has worked at every level of the cybersecurity world, from tester to director over the course of his 15 years in the industry. He brings a wealth of experience in both the testing and the compliance world after working with Fortune 500 companies, Global 1000 companies, and leading startups. And he's uniquely positioned to give you insight from both the technical and management perspectives, having led large scale teams to orchestrate security and risk assessments and taking over the full compliance standard and managing that for various companies throughout the Isha IT portfolio. Bramel is the founder and MD of Isha IT. Bramel is a veteran technologist with two decades managing teams at Sapient and Dow Jones before taking on the executive role as CTO of Everyday Health. Um, so his director level exposure gives at companies ranging from VC funded startups to enterprises like Dow Jones, allows him to triage the important aspects of security and compliance for each one of the companies in our portfolio. Um, today, they're going to be guiding us through SOC 2 and the benefits of adopting it as a compliance standard, preparing for a SOC 2 attestation in the process, what a SOC 2 looks for and what is covered in the SOC 2 attestation, the nuts and bolts, which Aditya will probably be doing, the cost advantages and the financial return on investment for a SOC 2 certification. Um, before I hand it off to Aditya and Bremel, we have found the best way to learn is by asking questions and engaging with our speakers. Between Aditya and Bremel, you have experienced technologists from both the implementation and management perspectives. So please feel free to send questions into the Q&A panel and we will address them at the end of the webinar. Without further ado, I would like to give it over to Bremel to start you off. Thank you, guys. Thanks. I think, uh, Aditya, why don't you start and then I'll take over if you don't mind. Sure. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Aditya. I'm the Chief Cybersecurity Officer at Isha IT. I help run all of cybersecurity operations over at Isha IT. I come from a deep enterprise security background, having done everything from pen testing to compliance projects over the years. Um, and today, you know, we expertise in working with various organizations, especially in the SMB space. So that's that's kind of my introduction. Excellent, thanks, Aditya. Hi, Premal here. Uh, you know, Shalin already gave quite a bit of a background. I think he called me a veteran. Uh, I'm not that old. I know I look it with all the white hair, but uh, it's not that bad. But seriously, uh, you know, we've worked with all sorts of companies from the small startups to large, and uh, would love to help you as you think about your cybersecurity journey. Uh, we are US based with offices in the Middle East and in India as well. Um, so that's what uh, some of our background is. In terms of uh, what we do as a company, to give you a bit of that, uh, we really do the full service from cybersecurity. So we help clients think through cybersecurity strategy, what's important to them, you know, where is their uh, data that they care about, uh, you know, what compliances should they be going after, whether it's an ISO or a SOC 2 or a high trust, depending on the industry they're in, depending on their maturity, if you will. And today, of course, we're talking about SOC 2, but we can have some of the same conversations on, on you know, whichever acronym that you want to go after from a compliance perspective. Uh, we also help companies think through uh, how do you get there, right? So, and, and Aditi will talk about it. One is understanding, you know, what are your gaps from a compliance perspective? And then the issue becomes, what uh, steps do I need to take to, to fill those gaps? It's a lot of what we do is also the consulting side of things where we help our clients think through policy procedure writing, risk management, uh, business continuity planning, VCSO type uh, tasks, if you will. Uh, and then, you know, the other part of what we do is security testing. So everything from application pen testing to external 
uh, network testing to phishing exercises, uh, and then the threat management, the 24 seven side of things where we help clients with incident management, uh, as well as just monitoring of their, of their posture. Um, so in for our clients full service all the way from strategy to the 24 seven uh, reaction, if you will. Uh, so the first question that people ask is, you know, which industries are under threat? Where should I really care about uh, security and then SOC 2 specifically? And frankly, you know, if you look at the news, right, it's really every company right now, whether it's healthcare, financial services, commerce, uh, you know, cybersecurity and ransomware and phishing and attacks are, are common nowadays. It doesn't matter where you are in the world. Uh, doesn't matter which industry you're in. And really what we've seen is there are two types of attackers. There are ones that, are, that care about going after larger companies because they're trying to get that, uh, you know, that uh, the company with the reputation. So, you know, you've seen those, whether it's a Home Depot or a Merck or companies like that, where they're trying to bring down a company that has, that's very well known and be able to attack that. But then, you know, it is a business. Hacking is a business and, and the threat is a, is a business for a lot of companies. And those, co those hackers will also go after small and medium companies because they realize that uh, in some of those cases, the security posture is not as strong. And so, you know, we're seeing uh, large companies getting attacked, but we're also seeing a lot of small and medium uh, because it's frankly easier to get into those and take data out or uh, create a ransomware situation, if you will. And so it's across the board. Uh, and what we're also seeing is, you know, large reputable companies, the ones we all know of, the brands, if you will, uh, have realized that, of course, they need to be, uh, you know, strong from a cyber posture perspective, but that a lot of their risk is carried by their vendors. And so you, what we've seen is a lot more push from the brands to their vendors saying, you know, prove your compliance. And it's going beyond what used to be okay five, 10 years ago which is just an audit questionnaire to, hey, what certifications do you have? How do, you, how do we know you're really secure? Because at the end of the day, even if uh, our vendor that's smaller gets uh, attacked and hacked and breached, it's really the reputation of the brand that gets affected. And so we're seeing larger companies pushing down compliance standards, security standards uh, to their vendors um, as well. Cool. Um, so that's that. So, Let's talk about SOC and what is SOC and you know more details around it. It is a framework. It's it's uh, the American Institute of CPAs that came out with the framework, and that's what they've put in place, uh, and that's what we uh, audit against, if you will. There are, depending on what you're looking at, three different SOC types, if you will. Uh, there's a SOC one, which is very much about financial controls. SOC two, which is about security as well as more. And we'll talk about what the as well as more means, but it looks at security at a minimum, but can also look at you know, uh, other trust principles around processing, integra integrating conf confidentiality others. And then there's SOC 3, which is very, very similar to SOC 2, but uh, is more public and have it, uh, have it reports out. Uh, you know, they've changed names around quite a bit. So what used to be called SSAE and uh, others is now, you know, SOC 1, 2, and 3 sort of uh, collapsed to those names, if you will. Uh, all attestations are done annually. So whether it's a SOC 1, 2, or 3, and really within that, again, we'll talk about it. There are two types of reports. So when we talk about a SOC 2, there's a type 1 and a type 2. And a type 1 is the way to think about it is that's an instance in time. So, you know, usually in your journey, uh, you'll do a SOC 2 type 1, and that's an instance in time showing that you're complying with, with, that, with the SOC framework, if you will. And then a type 2 is more over time, right? So uh, you do a type 1, and then six to nine months later, you'd go in and do a type 2, showing that you are following those practices consistently and not just as a one-time activity. Make sense? I know there are questions coming in as well. Uh, we're going to try to hold off on those questions as much as we can. Uh, to the end, just to, uh, you know, not break the flow too much, uh, and then we'll get to those. So uh, we will get to all the questions as well. SOC 2, uh, you know, as, as mentioned, it is the American Institute of CPAs that, that drives it. Um, and 
what it consists of is five principles. And what will happen is when you pick your partner for your SOC 2 journey, uh, you and them will sit down, hopefully it's Isha, but it could be someone else, and say, okay, which principles do we care about? Security is mandatory, right? You don't really have a choice around security. But depending on the business area you're in, depending on uh, what you are concerned about, uh, you might have all of the rest of the principles or some subset of those. Uh, so, you know, whether it's availability or privacy or uh, confidentiality, all of those will depend on uh, what's needed from your business perspective, uh, working with your partner. Cool. Uh, benefits of a SOC, right? You know, why go down a SOC too? I think we talked about this a bit uh, already, but you know, what we're seeing is it's a structured program, right? There's more and more need of, I just don't need an antivirus software or my firewall isn't good enough, but how do I make sure as a firm or as a company we're secure end to end? And so having a framework, having a program that is looking at, you know, the breadth of security and not just depth in one place becomes really important. Uh, it is looking at it across the organization as we talked about. It helps companies also build up trust in the brand reputation, right? Uh, we're seeing more and more uh, what I'd call mid-sized clients needing some compliance. And we'll talk about different ones out there, uh, whether it's SOC 2 or an ISO or high trust, but needing some compliance to prove security uh, to their partners or to their clients. And so brand reputation, trust becomes part of it. And we're seeing clients saying, uh, to their vendors that, hey, I'm not going to go with a client that is not SOC certified or, uh, you know, because it just doesn't make sense. And so it is becoming table stakes, if you will. And, you know, why do it? At the end of the day, you're also trying to reduce your chances of a breach, right? Uh, so between covering the breadth, thinking about security as a program, and covering uh, the reputational risk, that's really the benefits of why companies are looking at SOC 2 uh, and going for that. Uh, so, you know, why get a SOC 2? Should you get a SOC 2? You know, the answer is yes, uh, you know, or you should be thinking about it, right? Frankly, even if you're not ready for a SOC 2 or a certification program from a security perspective, uh, as you grow your company and as you think about it, you should be thinking about what framework do I care about? And maybe it's a year from now, maybe it's two years from now, what am I going to go for? And whether it's, you know, we talked about this, whether it's in banking, whether it's in health, whether it's in your SaaS provider, proving compliance and proving security is becoming as important as having security. Uh, because what big reputable brands don't want to do is go in and audit every one of their vendors in detail. They just don't have the time to do it uh, and make sure they're secure. So they're looking at compliance standards to do that for them. Uh, so, you know, Yes, the answer is yes, you should get a SOC 2 or some other standard, but it really, of course, depends on where you are in the journey of maturity of your company as well. Cool. Uh, last slide that I'm going to go through, and then we're going to give it back to Aditya, is a lot of clients ask us, you know, which standard should we go for, right? And, you know, here we're comparing ISO and SOC, but the ones we hear about again and again are, you know, SOC, ISO, high trust, PCI, and HIPAA. You know, those are the ones that are big out there, especially in the U.S. market, if you will. The way to think about it is it really depends on what business you're in. If you're in health, high trust becomes much more important or HIPAA, which is really not a certification standard, but, uh, but those two become important. Uh, if you're not in those, then most, and if you're looking at credit cards, then of course you have to be PCI compliant. But otherwise, really, it's an ISO versus SOC conversation in most of our clients. And uh, they're very, very similar, right? In lots of ways. Uh, as, as we call out, 96% of the security principles and controls are the same. Uh, you know, they're all based on being, on looking at the breadth of security and not just the depth. They all are based on being able to certify a standard. And so they're very, very similar in that sense. And so we do have clients saying, hey, I'm going for a SOC 2, but I want to follow it up with an ISO or vice versa. Where they are different is, you know, if you're an international company, if you're working in multiple uh, geographic locations, then ISO is much more the standard that's accepted internationally. Uh, SOC 2 is very much 
a U.S. standard, if you will. So if you're working in the U.S. market or trying to get into the U.S. market, uh, SOC 2 becomes much more prevalent. Uh, but if you're looking and saying, I want one standard that's internationally accepted, then, uh, you know, it's an ISO that's there. Both of them have certification bodies behind them uh, to do the final certification. Uh, you know, the last, uh, the couple of next things I'd call out is from our experience, we've seen ISO certification cost uh, more than a SOC 2 attestation, uh, you know, in that range. Uh, but it's not always the case, right? But that's what we've seen. Uh, the other part of it is, as the controls are the same, it's really the cost of that certification body that differentiates a bit. And then the other part of it is implementation timelines tend to differ a bit, right? Uh, not by a lot, but ISO seems to take a bit longer than a SOC 2, especially because also SOC 2, you have the type 1 and type 2, where you can get a type 1 and then follow it up with a type 2. Uh, so similar in lots of ways. Uh, you know, we can help you decide which framework is important. Uh, we can help you decide, you know, does it make sense to finish one and then go after the other or not, right? Depending on where your business is and what it's trying to accomplish. Uh, so that gives you some level of, you know, some grounding on what is a SOC 2, uh, why go after a SOC 2, what are the benefits of a SOC 2. Uh, oh, I think the next slide, is it here, you're taking over? Yep. All righty, thank you. It's coming to the, the meat, the, the actual security implementer's uh, dream, <laughs> as I'd put it. So SOC 2 implementation is very similar to most other implementation of any other security standard out there, whether you're looking at ISO, whether you're looking at HIPAA, high trust. But there's one little element which SOC 2 stresses on, which is customer data. Customer data is, is the crown jewel for SOC 2. Right. So the first thing. Uh, so what we've what I've what I've done here is I've tried to put down about sixteen steps that an across four phases that an organization should undertake when they're planning to go through the SOC two implementation. Now this is a tried and tested form of you know formula of ours, and this is something that we've helped various organizations in the past to meet SOC two requirements. So we first start out with an organization understanding. What I mean by organization understanding is, why is it that you need a SOC 2? What elements of your business comes under the purview of SOC 2? Do you have an application that needs to be the only scope that needs to be a part of SOC 2? So really understanding your scope, understanding where do you take in client data? Do you have PII? Do you have PCI data? So what type of data, all of that, right? Next is identifying all of your assets, understanding what would come in the purview of a scope for your SOC 2 and then dis distributing them or, 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 or marking criticality against each such asset for you to understand which ones are more important to secure first and then moving on to the others. So at this point, once you've understood how big or small your scope is, once you've identified how many assets come into picture from a SOC 2 implementation standpoint, it's very important to go back and have a realistic conversation with your management and decide what should be your target date for SOC 2, right? So there are two levels, uh, two types of reports, and we come to it later, but even your type one report, what is the target date, date, date that you're trying to hit, right? So understanding your current security uh, posture, and then understanding what is the deadline that you've got from say clients, right? That is when you have that tough conversation with your management and understand what should be your target date. Once that's set, you move into the implementation strategy and teams. So just like, you know, just like the, the phrase goes, a goal without a, without a plan is just a dream. So this is exactly the point where you go back and you understand, you put down a strategy, you think about what are the high level things that you have to uh, figure out in the next couple of months and then designate certain teams that have to work on this function. So it's very, very important just like to have management uh, buy-in. It's very, very important to have sparks in place who are going to lead this entire journey till the very end, right? Uh, at this point is when you move on to the next phase. So the next phase is where you really understand how close or how far you are. This is where you go in and do a current state analysis. What I would suggest is take the checklist, do an analysis on your own or with another consulting division and understand 
uh, what are your current gaps and what what where do you lie from a security standpoint right once you've understood that once you've understood your gaps this is when you go in and you define your controls so if there's a gap associated to people security then you know that you need a security awareness training module right and then you also go in and you map the existing controls maybe your security awareness was being done using ppts right so you you take in all of those existing controls at which said path in, during the entire second phase you're essentially trying to identify your gaps and define define what type of future controls you might have so gap might be the fact that you don't have a security monitoring solution so you define a control that you would require a sim slash a 24 by 7 security monitoring solution right so that's that's essentially phase 2 so phase 2 is understanding where you're at uh, how far or close you are from SOC 2 and defining what kind of controls you need to have in place to meet SOC 2 requirements. Now, and as part of uh, phase three, you'll go in and start writing up your policy procedures or updating it. Now, policy procedures are, are like the marching orders for soldiers, right? This essentially is your SOP. This essentially tells your entire team about what needs to be done in what conditions and who's responsible and who's accountable. Right, and you call out what kind of technologies, what kind of tools, what kind of uh, you know procedures have to be followed in cases of various uh, various uh, to follow to meet certain requirements of SOC 2. So it could be a change management. Uh, say we pick up a change management procedure. Uh, if there's a critical uh, patch that comes out, you know someone has to pick it up. Someone has to go in and update it within eight hours. This has to be tested in a test environment and then approved by the security head, et cetera, et cetera. So all of these workflows are understood and, 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 and documented and approved by your security officer. After which, you know, there would be certain gaps from a control stand, standpoint still. So, you know, for security monitoring at this point, you may not have identified uh, a vendor. You might have called out the fact that in your procedure that you would have 24 by seven, but this is essentially the point where you go in and you select your controls, you select what kind of products you need, and then effect, you, you assess whether they're actually effective or not, and whether they meet SOC 2 requirements. So that's to do with phase three. Once phase three is done, the last step is very important because it's important for an organization to actually assess whether that particular control is in place, whether everybody in the organization has taken up the security awareness training, whether there is actual change management uh, that is followed, whether it is possible for you to call back a backup, you know, uh, in, in case, you know, and, and really test that out. So this is essentially where you, you, you test your controls and you check whether they're actually effective. Then you move on to the last phase, which is all about audit. Uh, before going in for a final audit, I would recommend a pre-audit, which is nothing but understanding whether you actually meet the requirements or not. So this is the last step in identifying you know, your last few gaps, and then you go ahead and remediate yourself. And then uh, you move in for a type one audit. Now, a type one audit is conducted by a CPA. The CPA typically comes in, looks at documentation, reviews that. And a type one audit is something like a documentation review. So all of your policy procedures, how well documented they are, what kind of workflows and SOPs do you have, that's essentially assessed. After which you have to, there would of course be controls called out in them and the auditor would look at them, but the auditor is essentially looking out for whether they are actually in use or not. So it's unlike most other security standards, you actually have to show whether these have been implemented and whether they're effective or not. So after, the, after your type one report, the, the CPA writes up the type one report, you have to showcase about six to nine months of maintenance of these controls before which you can go in for the final type two audit, right? And the type two audit, the auditor comes in and actually assesses whether these controls and these countermeasures have been effective and whether they've been applied and implemented for a said six to nine months, right? This in essentially ensures that organizations actually maintain and sustain SOC2 rather than just go ahead and meet that particular requirement for audit and then go back and change everything, right? So that's typically how the approach would look. I'd go into the phase one. The phase one is typically identifying what are your applicable TSPs or today it's called trust uh, TSCs, your trust service criteria. 
defining a system scope. It's very, very important to understand what is actually a system scope. Uh, what I would suggest here is to try and reduce your scope as much as possible. It's always easier to protect the diamond on in Yankee Stadium as compared to the entire Yankee Stadium. So understand what is your true scope understand what does your client require because it's all it's all client driven because it's client data that you're trying to secure so understand those parameters and then define your system scope define your target readiness date after speaking internally with your security teams and with your management to understand what's the real date that you could hit and then define a implementation strategy now a couple of points that I'd like to call out the scope is typically based on four criteria the first is management discretion. It completely depends on how big or small they want, what kind of deadline they're trying to hit. So they might want to certify a very, very small part of the organization first and then you know grow over time. Second is services rendered. Typically, if you're an HR tech company as compared to a FinTech, the number of TSPs that you would be applicable to you would be very different. And that's something I'll be speaking about in the next slide. Your requirement from clients, you know, clients might call it, call it out in contracts or through vendor questionnaires that your entire scope or your SaaS application has to be SOC 2 certified. So it's tested. So in that case, you know, your scope is defined by the requirement from the clients. And lastly, your key factors based on the location of your customer data and understanding what is your in-scope IT environment. So coming to the TSP applicability, and this is a common place where most organizations are, you know, are, are I think, biting more than they could chew, um, to be very, very frank. Uh, I'd like to first talk about security. So there are five TSPs or TSEs. There are five of them. Security is the de facto TSP that would be applied anytime you would do a SOC 2. The others is something that you can choose to add as part of your SOC 2 attestation. So security basically talks about whether client data can be compromised, as simple as that, right? And, and, and a compromise of your system, could it possibly lead to a leakage of customer data, right? So this is the bare minimum that you start with. And then based on the type of organization you are, if you're an HR tech firm, you know, maybe availability, processing, integrity, confidentiality may not come into picture. Maybe privacy would come into picture. Right? But if you're a fintech, you know, uh, availability, processing, integrity, confidentiality, all of those would come into picture. Now, what they essentially mean is availability is all about whether the system is in important to ensure continuity of service to a customer. Processing integrity is if there's a breakdown in, uh, for control, is it would would it would it lead to a lack of integrity in customer data, or do you have a rollback policy where you can go back and self-correct? right? Confidentiality is, does the system have any, any, any data that's, you know, classified as confidential, right? And privacy is all about whether you take in PII or personal data of customers. Now, based on experience, most organizations start out with security and then over time, you know, add the various other TSPs slash DSEs. Uh, what I've started to see is that, you know, when you add a new TSP, it's a small increment, but when you add privacy, it's a, it's an exponential jump in the number of requirements you have to meet. So each of the additional TSPs that get added just adds a couple of more requirements. That said, if you're a SaaS platform and you have to showcase, um, you know, you have to showcase SOC to attestation, and you're all about, uh, you, you know, you have you work with end clients, then you know security, availability, processing, integrity, and confidentiality, all four of them would come into picture as DSPs. Moving ahead, how, how does one really understand their current state uh, and, and where they're at, right? So the first step is to understand and identify your current policies, your procedures and controls. So go back, gather all your policies and procedures, see whether they have enough meat in them to basically meet SOC 2 requirements. So from a policy standpoint, is your information security policy, does it cover all elements associated to security? So you can maybe take any, any domains, you could take the ISO 27001 domains, you could look at COBIT, you could look at all of these other frameworks and then start developing your you know, policies and procedures. The end goal 
is to have a policy procedure that covers all the necessary facets of security. Then comes the element of controls, right? Understand what kind of controls do you have in place, right? Typically, a lot of times we see organizations may just have a basic set of controls. So it might be easy. But if you're a large organization, this entire process of collecting all of your policies and procedures and controls could be a Herculean task, right? Once that's done, um, you've kind of understood, you know, what, where you're at from a policy procedure or a current state. Uh, standpoint. This is when you go in and you define all of your controls, what, you know, you map the existing controls to the framework, and then you identify what kind of gaps do you have in controls, right? And that's typically when you go in and you start defining a remediation plan or what kind of future controls do you need? So the first four steps are all about understanding what you have and then identifying your gaps against the checklist, the SOC2 checklist and then defining what kind of future controls do you need and then writing up a remediation plan. In phases three and four, uh, it's to do with remediation and pre-audit. In, in phases three, in the phase three, it's all about remediation of gaps. So you can do it in two ways. The two essential steps are to update your policies and procedures. Why I've mentioned draft is sometimes, you know, a lot of young companies may not have policy procedures. So drafting your policy procedures to meet SOC2 requirements and uh, or update them to meet SOC2 requirements. So when I say meet SOC2 requirements, it's all about, like I mentioned, talk about what tool do you have? What kind of technology do you use to as a control? What kind of process do you have? Who's responsible? Who's accountable? And what kind of measurement metrics do you have? Or what kind of measurement do you do to ensure that this particular control is effective or not? Next is, uh, you know, selecting an implementation of controls. So there would be gaps uh, because certain controls do not exist. So select your control based on your type of environment. Say you're, a, you're present on AWS or you're on Azure, you know, you need security monitoring. Maybe you can just go with the with Sentinel for Azure for security monitoring, or, you know, you need an MDM. So you go ahead and you, 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 you speak to, you know, a couple of vendors, understand whether that particular uh, MDM would meet your requirements or not. Maybe you're a, you're a Mac and Windows shop. So you're typically looking for one which supports both platforms. So this is when you go through the entire uh, process of identifying the right kind of vendor, the right kind of control for you. And then you go ahead and implement this. Of course, not all controls require you to buy a service or product. There would be some controls that are to do with the process or would, to do, would need to be associated to a particular workflow. So, you know, have those, once it's defined in the policy procedures, it's all about implementing them so that they become a control in the end. Uh, once, you, once you're on the course of phase three, that is when I typically ask organizations to reevaluate your order dates. You know, this entire process for remediation could be as little as a month and could be as, as, as high as a year. Right? So organizations typically do take a very, very long time to update the policy procedures or update or, or, or implement the controls. And this is where it's very, very important for organizations to recalibrate at their end and you know, expectations with clients to understand what would be realistic audit dates. Right? I think phase three is typically where most organizations work with consulting you know, vendors to help figure out, you know, because they're the ones who really understand the ropes to help figure out how can they get there, you know, at the least, at least, least, at least amount of time. All right. So moving ahead for the, so once all of this is done, once your policy procedures are implemented, once your controls are in place, you move into the fourth phase, right? So fourth phase is all about testing the controls post remediation and then doing a final pre audit, right? Now the final pre audit is all about in, in the final pre-audit, you're doing an entire checklist-based audit to verify whether you actually meet SOC2 requirements or not. And then the last couple of gaps that are identified, you go ahead and remediate them, ensure you're all good, and then obtain the final go-ahead, either from your internal team or from a consulting company, whether you're good for the final audit or not. All right, this comes to this brings us to the final uh, SOC 2 audit process or attestation process. This is something that is conducted by a CPA and is divided into two parts, the type one and the type two. Um, in type one, they, like I mentioned, they're essentially looking at documentation. In type two, they're looking at 
uh, whether you've had controls in place, the controls that you've called out in your documentation, whether they've been in place for at least six to nine months, right? So how does the auditor typically conduct the SOC 2 audit process? They typically send you a questionnaire and uh, th this is used to assess what kind of documentation, I mean, what kind of controls do you have? What kind of documentation do you have for showcasing what kind of controls and what kind of documentation you would have to provide all this evidence. So this is where the auditor would request for evidence associated to the, the, the controls that you have in place. The, and the auditor goes in and reviews all of these controls, right? Once the evaluation has been completed, typically, you know, an auditor might have questions. He might ask for additional evidence. He might ask for you know, certain other documentation, he might ask for some clarifying questions. So this is, you know, this, this particular step is when auditor needs a little more information to really understand whether you've actually met the requirement or not. Once he's done that and you've satisfactorily met the requirements of SOC 2 is when he starts writing up the report. Now, like I mentioned in the first phase, he's writing up the SOC 2 type one report. If your documentation meets the requirement, post which after six to nine months is when he comes back in again assesses whether you've actually had controls in place for six to nine months, then writes up this type two report. At this point is when, you know, you've, you've essentially met SOC 2 requirements. So this is the time when you can, you know, you can put that logo on your website and be proud that you've actually done something uh, because I know it's, it's a Herculean task for organizations to meet this particular requirement. All right. So, I'm going to quickly talk about some common pitfalls and some common areas where organizations uh, falter. The first is a lack of stakeholder uh, buy-in, right? There would be a mismatch in what the management requires. Maybe the management just wants a SAC, uh, the SaaS application to be certified, but you know the, the, the CISO is trying to certify the entire entity, or they don't have support from management for budgetary reasons, right? So it's very, very important to have that realistic conversation with your various stakeholders, with your IT team, especially because they would go in and do all the remediation, get them to understand what the effort would be and what could it be from a budgetary standpoint. Next is insufficient communication and education internally, both on the management and the internal staff. So it's very, very important that all the policies and procedures are accepted, signed off and understood and actually implemented. Poor scoping, like I mentioned, it's it's very, very important to try and reduce your scope as much as possible for the first SOC 2 to whatever is essential and then over time build on your scope. Next is failing to perform a pre-audit. Uh, this is a very, very important one because most organizations, once they have all the controls in place, they said, you know what, we're good for this. We can get started on, on the type one or the type two audit. But that's not true. It's very, very important that organizations actually have an independent audit conducted to actually verify whether they meet it or not. Sometimes when self-attestation, we might stay, say that you know, a particular requirement has met the requirement, a particular control has met the requirement, but that might be far from true. They might be that you know, maybe, uh, maybe patching is only happening for certain classes of servers. Right? So in patch management, you know, IT is called out that, yes, patch management happens and it's based on these, these SLAs, but then you realize that you know, your server management tool can only do it for Windows systems, right? It can't do it for Linux. So that's an, that's an example of where a control has failed, right? So that, that basically talks about the next category also, significant control failures, right? And then... Uh, you know, and, and then you have a couple of other ones associated to lack of internal control monitoring, no subservice organization monitoring. This is another important one. Understanding what kind of controls you would inherit from your service providers, right? And actually factoring them into, you know, what you have. Maybe because of the nature of your contracts, because you're on a certain CSP, the actual requirements that you have to meet would reduce drastically because of, you know, inheriting certain controls from, you know, your, your cloud service provider. So it's very, very important to understand that and having some monitoring mechanism there. And lastly, it's inadequate evidence that is provided to the auditor to assess. So even though you may not have to give evidence of an antivirus on all the systems, but you still have to give it for a couple of systems to showcase whether that's actually in place, whether it's being updated frequently. All right. So before we 
you know, this is this is the last couple of slides, but I'd like to quickly talk to you about the timeline of typically how long it takes. So from a preparation standpoint, what we've seen is most organizations take about two to six months during which they create or update their policy procedures, they update their internal processes, implement whatever controls need to be in place and train their employees, right? This typically takes about two, two to six months and organizations either they do it themselves or work with the consulting entity to help figure this out. This is when organizations, once they've finished all the preparation work, they say that they're, they're ready for SOC 2. I, like I mentioned, it's very, very important to do a pre-audit. So organizations typically do a pre-audit. They understand whether they're actually ordered ready. The last final gaps are identified. You know, you have the final remediation that happens. Typically all organizations find some last gaps, last few gaps. So that's very, very normal. And then you get the final go ahead for audit from your pre-audit expert, right? This is when, you know, you typically pick up the phone, you call a CPA, you engage a CPA firm, they come and do a type one audit, right? A type one audit, like I mentioned, they're essentially looking at your documentation, looking at what kind of documentation do you have for process and controls. It's a point in time check. And, um, and this typically takes two, two weeks, right? Now I've mentioned the word optional here. For a, for a reason. If you're an organization that's actually secure, security mature, and you've done certifications of various natures in the past, you have had, you have very robust documentation, your controls have been in place for, for more than six to nine months, then a type one may be an optional step for you. You can just go straight into a type two, right? Where the auditor comes in, does a review of the documentation again, reviews whether the controls are actually in line with the documentation and effective. Also, he verifies whether the process is in line with the policies and procedures, right? And then he can write up the final type two report, right? The report, so the audit takes about a week, but the final report takes about two to three weeks with the recommendation from the assessor stating whether you meet requirements or you don't, right? So. That's another a small thing that most organizations feel that they have to do a type one and a, then a type two. But if you're an organization that has been implementing security for, for a couple of years, type one is absolutely optional, right? And then is when you go into the renewal phase. Um, so like Premal mentioned earlier, SOC two is something that needs to be renewed every year. And uh, you basically, this, this entire step takes about a week or two. And this is something that, you know, in, in this particular case, over the course of year, your scope must have changed. Certain policies might have changed. Procedures must have changed. So I would always recommend organizations to again do a pre-audit, assess whether, whether you actually still meet SOC 2 requirements, and then bring in the CPA to do the final audit. And then that's your renewal audit right there. So this is typically how long organizations take. So if you're doing SOC 2 for the first time, it's going to take you anywhere between you know, the whole process is going to take you about a year, give or take, but you can reach type one pretty fast. If, if, if you're on a short deadline, you can get there in like less than four months, right? And a type one is good enough as a credential to showcase to most clients, right? Right, so moving on to my last slide before we open up for questions. Finding the right partner for your SOC 2 journey. I think this is very, very important. The two little elements I'd like, it, like to talk about one is your implementation partner, the guys who actually help you, who are in the trenches with you, work with you, help figure out your policy procedures, help figure out what kind of controls you should have, right? And then next is your assessor. Which CPA firm do you choose, right? For doing your final attestation audits, right? So in both cases, I think more so in the implementation partner, it's very, very important to understand the experience and the reputation they have as an organization. And experience, when I talk about experience, is actually find out who's the consultant who's going to work on this project, right? The company is only as good as the experience of the consultant. So understand what kind of experience, how many SOC 2s has he done, right? Uh, what kind of background does he have from a security implementation standpoint? Then look at what is their projected plan of action for helping you get to SOC 2, right? Understand what kind of outcomes they promise and what kind of key results do they promise. It's very... Uh, at this point, I'd, I'd, I'd like to call it a little point. You know, sometimes organizations, especially consulting organizations, are guilty of saying that, you know what, you can get there in two months. Realistically understand 
can you get there in two months? Any organization that's promising you these, you know, meeting a certain require a certain certification in a very short span of time might be, you know, that might be a red flag there. So understand what kind of outcomes and key results do they promise, and then go back and ask him what all do I have to do for my end to, you know, meet SOC two requirements. Then look at case studies, testimonials, do a reference check, and then you come in for the cost proposal discussion and the terms and conditions, right? So this is typically how you would find your, you know, the right partner for a SOC two journey. Similar steps for an assessor as well, right? Assessor, of course, you cannot ask him for a projected plan. I mean, you can ask him for what. how they intend to do the entire process but maybe you know the other steps may not be as as relevant the experience and reputation and cost proposals would be the only thing that would matter all right so that said that was to do with soc2 and how can an organization meet soc2 requirements we do uh, we typically do about 2 to 3 webinars every month we have one coming up in in on on the october on october 29th that's to do with Health data security and how it impacts Australian companies. We have a couple of other webinars coming next month. One's on penetration testing, one or two, in which we go a little bit deeper into what does penetration testing all entail. We have conducted a couple of one-on-one sessions in the past, but the one or two session is essentially going to talk about what kind of tools, what kind of techniques, what kind of procedures do our pen testers use to identify vulnerabilities, and that's on November third. then we have a very interesting one the day in a life of a ciso what does a ciso juggle every day and what kind of uh, activities does a ciso kind of typically do on a daily basis right so are you worrying about security and uh, sorry compliance and worrying about risk are you worrying about your next management meeting so we we talk about some of those nuances and this is a this is a fire uh, fireside chat it's going to be fun so that's another one to look out for and the floor is open for qna before i hand it over to to shalin and premo uh, th- these are our linkedin handles you can also send us an email or give us a call we're happy to talk to you about your soc2 journey right at this point i'm going to hand it over to the able hands of premo and shalin and the floor is open for questions so i'd love to hear from all of you um so the first question that i got was is soc2 recognized outside of the united states Yes, so SOC two is recognized outside uh, outside uh, the United States, but it's more prevalent in North America. It is a security certification, um, but I mean, if you're a service provider for any company in America, it's like a de facto. I mean, so so if you're a service provider or if you're being asked for uh, a SOC two, then it's relevant for you. Yeah, the only thing I'd add uh, to that, Aditya, is. you know talk to you know talking about executive buy in understand with your executives you know what makes sense right so if most of your clients are us based absolutely uh if most of your clients are not in the us then yes they might recognize it but they will be looking more for maybe an isa so have that conversation up front and even see what's in the contracts right when you're getting audit questions are they asking for a soft tour or are they saying hey do you have an isa look at that to to make that decision if you want. Thank you. The next one is a clarification. Can you guys go over the difference between the type 1 and type 2 attestations for SOC 2? So type 1 is essentially looking at documentation and what kind of process and what kind of controls do you have in place? The auditor typically comes in and reads reviews all of that. The type 2 is when they actually look at whether the controls are actually in place. You have to showcase evidence for 6 to 9 months. of that particular control being in place. So if you if you say that yes we've been doing security monitoring and X is my security monitoring vendor, you have to showcase evidence that you've been doing so for the last 6 to 9 months and this is where your logs for the last 6 to 9 months are stored, right? So this is typically or you say I've been doing backups for 6 to for you know using this process, you have to be able to show that you've been able you know you've you've done that in the last 6 to 9 months. So that's typically the difference. and uh, the age old question uh what is the cost associated with the soc2 certification 
No, right. I'm going to ask Prem to take this. <laughs> oh, um, you know, it really depends on what we mean by cost. And what I mean by that is there is the cost of an implementation partner and the CPA, but then there's the cost of, you know, tools you might need to pa- buy and things like that. Uh, from an implementation partner CPA, it varies, right? It depends on who you go to. Uh, if you're going to an ENY or a, one of the big four, of course, costs are going to be significantly higher than some others. But typically, I'd put, I'll throw a number out there and be completely wrong. Uh, for implementation partner, along with the station, uh, with the partners we use and the CPAs we use, I'd say around uh, 30 to 60. 30 to 50, 30 to 60, um, Yeah. Talk about putting me on the spot. Um, <laughs> and I also like to add a point there, like Premal mentioned, I mean, that's to do only with the attestation and the redness, but also depends on what kind of tools do you buy, right? Yeah. You could go and typically go blow up $100,000 on, on the state of the art security monitoring solution, or you could go with a security solution, monitoring solution, that's only a couple of thousand, right? So, so that's another, that's, that's a big variable factor. Um, and there is a follow-up on that, but uh, I would like to add that we could give you that advice too, as an implementation expert or a person that is helping you achieve that SOC 2 compliance standard. Um, we would help you make those decisions for yourself and give you the options that we think fit your company the best way. Um, to follow up with that, though, is yeah, there Shaman, any... Yeah, before, you, before you go to the next question, I think that's a good point, right? I think with, because we work with companies of all sizes, uh, and, you know, the market's changing quite a bit, what you see is lots of security tools out there that claim to do everything. And understanding which security tools do you need to really secure what you have, right, from a strategy perspective, it doesn't mean you have to go buy the most expensive thing. Uh, and having that conversation up front and being objective about it because we are not representing a vendor. Uh, you know, we are your partners so and that becomes important. Back to you. Um, so the, the follow-up to the cost question was, is there a yearly cost associated with it since you need to recertify? Yeah, so you typically have to get your type two order done every year. So that's, that's the only yearly cost that's associated with keeping up your SOC 2. But that's going to be significantly, what you'll see is year one costs will be quite a bit higher, of course, because that's when you have the implementation partner. That's when you have to go write up your policies if you don't have them. And then hopefully costs come down quite a bit yeah. uh, year over year. Yeah. yeah. Um, and this one is more, I think, contextual. Are there tangible benefits you've seen uh, for from your clients for getting a SOC 2? Or like what kind of vendors do you know that are looking or specifically requiring their um, their associates to get a SOC two. The multiple questions in there. Um, yeah. So let me take a couple of those, and then I'm sure that they will add on. So the last part, you know, what kind of vendors who's looking for a SOC two? You know, we're seeing it more and more across industries. Uh, if you are working with a, a with an other company that's larger, right? So if you are a SaaS provider if you're a vendor to a healthcare company or a financial company, um, then we're seeing a lot of just prove your security with compliance and not just uh, say you're secure. Um, so we're seeing more of that, right? So, and, and it picks up whether it's a SaaS provider or a vendor to a bigger company. So we're seeing that across the board. Uh, tangible benefits, yeah, I think, you know, the two parts, right, frankly, there's the part of, I can now market and go after clients that otherwise I would not be able to get because I can prove my certification out. And then the more you know, realistic and important one is also, I'm now more secure, right? No one's gonna say you'll never get breached, but you're looking at it from a breadth perspective and you're looking to make sure you have a framework in place that you can improve over time. Um, so you know, both from a marketing perspective and a security perspective, yeah, absolutely. We've seen our clients um, see the benefit of it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, you save you save on so much. I mean, direct and indirect breach costs. And I think showcasing a security credential in today's day and age is a must, right? And a SOC 2 credential that way is very, very popular with organizations and service providers around the world. So so like Prem mentioned, both from a marketing and security standpoint, I think it, 
it really helps accelerate growth in both in a revenue, but also helps save your bottom line that could po- possibly be eroded by a security incident. And, and you know, I'll just, uh, from my previous experience when it wasn't running Isha, uh, it's table stakes now, right? Things have changed quite a bit. So five, six, seven years ago, uh, maybe a bit more than that, uh, you would be able to grow the company significantly without having security compliance certifications, right? So, you know, companies I work for, uh, you know, when they started, didn't have those. Now it's become much more table stakes just because the maturity of the hackers has improved, frankly, right? They're become uh, better at hacking. They're become better at the breaches. Uh, you know, we're all working from home nowadays. And so all of those things is causing more, more uh, security focus. And so what used to be things you wouldn't think about as much before, now you don't have as much of a choice. Sean, thank anything? you. Yeah, there are actually a couple. Um, I think one of the questions lends itself to more of an overarching question that I'll try to phrase. Um, many companies are trying to get multi-compliant. So they're going to go after SOC 2 and ISO, maybe include GDPR with that. How does that affect the timeline? And how does that affect cost? And can we handle all of those? I'm going to give that to the team. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so that, that's, that's a great question. I think that's something that all organizations face as a big challenge. You have to certify against and keep your credentials against five different standards. It's a nightmare. You can't be spending all year trying to meet this. That's exactly where you have to come up with a common control framework or an integrated management system. What you do is, I mean, so typically what we do for organizations and how we've helped them do that is we take all these standards, we map all of the controls together, we map the requirements and then call out, you know, what do you have to do? So an ISO requires a security awareness training too, you know, just like SOC 2, just like in a PCI DSS. But of course, they, they all have their nuances and different activities required. For example, ISO requires you to, you know, fill out an S, a statement of applicability. A SOC 2 requires controls to be in place for six to nine months. A GDPR might require you to do a you know, uh, a DPI, you know, activity or, you know, so you have to get those privacy assessments conducted. So, so, you know, it's, they would of course be these deltas, but the only way to combat this is to take all the standards, create a common framework, and then work towards eliminating each of the requirements one after the other, else it's just chaos, right? And, and of course, another, another pro trip, a pro tip would be to, kind of have all of your documentation and map all of that back to these requirements. It really helps when it's time for audit. Yeah, and uh, Aditya, you didn't answer the question about timeline and cost. Oh, sorry, I'm so sorry, I forgot. (laughs) Okay, from a timeline, (laughs) yeah, from a timeline and cost standpoint, I think if you do, if for example, if you're doing SOC 2, ISO, GDPR together, right? you know, how you would, if you do it separately, it's three X the time, right? But you can possibly do it in like two X or lesser the time. What we've typically seen is it can reduce effort and time by almost 50%, right? And doing this common, the more, the more mature your common control framework is, the lesser time. So you can maybe bring it down to 30 to 40%, right? But I mean, right off the bat, you know, that's the advantage you get both in uh, cost from an implementation standpoint, I think cost will be much more and a time standpoint, both internal resources and you know tools and things like that. Yes, there would be some cost associated with certification of each type or a final assessment. That's the only thing that would you know still be there, but that will nevertheless still be there. But from an implementation cost standpoint, it would drastically reduce, right? And yeah. you can, you can, you can, you know, you it's, it's like you know. You, you can try and shoot my, multiple birds with just one stone. Well, I know you're uh, going over time, but I agree with you, Aditi. I think uh, you reduce some costs, but overall it does help quite a bit. Any other questions? And to answer the one question that was, to be right on the nose about it, yes, Isha can assist with both SOC and ISO. It is the most common combination of compliance certifications that we do together. Yep. Um, so I hope that answers that. No. Um, and that was the last question. Uh, if there's any more, please feel free to send it in. Otherwise, I'm going to let it at the end frame. We'll wrap it up. 
Well, thank you for your time. Hopefully this is valuable. Uh, you know, we do have a few more webinars coming up, uh, but feel free to ping any one of us with questions and, and we'll get back to you. Thank you all for your time. You have a great day ahead. And uh, I, I look forward to hearing from most of you. Thank you. Thanks.